This is the Gospel Feast series for those that need a little meat after the milk. It's time to feast on the Word. We are continuing our study of the book of Daniel. Where we left off, Daniel has survived now two occupations. The Babylonians have fallen to the Persians, and now he is an emissary of Judah, an emissary of certainly Jehovah, to the Persians. So that's where we'd like to pick up. Now, before we get started, we welcome questions. We will strive to answer those on every seventh episode. You can contact us and ask questions through the gospelfeastbooks.com website. There's a contact link. You can also email us, gospelfeastbooks at gmail.com. Now let's continue our feast in Daniel. Uh, Read. where had we left off? What, what is the current situation of Daniel and his relations with the new occupiers, the Persians? We do have some stories and mythologies, traditions, and even some scriptures that didn't make it into the King James that deal with Daniel under the Persians. And they're really kind of wonderful stories. One of them is known as the Rescue of Susanna. And uh, let me just share it with you. The story goes like this. There was a beautiful Hebrew woman named Susanna who was bathing in her garden privately, and she had sent her attendants away because she wanted to be modest, when she was observed bathing by two lustful men without her knowledge. As she makes her way back to the house, the men accost her, and they threaten to tell her husband that she was only pretending to bathe privately so that she could meet a secret lover that she had. Unless she agreed to have sex with them, they were going to expose her to her husband and have her humiliated and probably killed since this would have been adultery. It was a terrible dilemma for Susanna. What was she supposed to do? One way she would be an adulteress, and the other way she would be accused before everybody of being an adulteress. And possibly killed. Well, and probably likely killed if she were brought to the Jewish court and stoned for being an adulteress. Well, Susanna refused to be blackmailed. She decided she was going to keep her honor. And the men were true to their threat, and Susanna was arrested, and she was drug out into court with threats of being stoned. And when Daniel heard this, he interrupted the court and said that he wanted to have the two lustful men be questioned separately. Now, apparently this hadn't happened before. No, that's clever. That's actually a common tactic used today by police forces and uh, investigators to make sure people aren't collaborating their stories before being questioned. Tradition says this was the first time that this was thought of. Oh, interesting. Interesting, Well, it's it's a brilliant tactic we use today. So good old Daniel. Well, he actually had them both questioned, and what he discovered is that the men's stories didn't line up. So Daniel used that to show that the men were not telling the truth and that Susanna was indeed faithful and she was restored to her place. And in due process created a new interrogation tactic that has lasted to this day. (laughs) Well, he might have and we might blame him for getting drug in the other room when our wife is crying behind the scenes because the FBI is chewing one out over another, who knows. But it worked for Daniel, so good for him. The other story is actually included in the Catholic version of the Bible and got pulled from the King James. We don't know why, but it's a wonderful story. There's no reason to not have it in our Bibles or not know it. It's known as Daniel and the Priests of Bel. Now, you remember his name was Belteshazzar. See? Named after the gods of Babylon. Well, sure, and Bel. Bel ultimately is Saturn, the planet Saturn. Most people don't really understand that, but the planets were worshipped as gods in their day, and that's a long story we'll get into if we deal with Genesis. It's very important. You really can't get your mind around the ancients or around some of the symbolism if you don't know that God gave the heavens as signs for man, as it says in Genesis, and that Lucifer very cleverly switched it so that they weren't signs but actually were God and gods. Well, you know, we, we see planetary symbols used all the time in ancient religious studies. So that stemmed from that. That stemmed from that beginning with Adam, is what you're saying. Yes. It was known as the Watcher Cult because they would watch the heavens. Ah, since they believed they were gods or signs of the gods, then they had to be watched attentively in lieu of listening to the Spirit of the Lord or listening to Jehovah. We still see this today in astrology, where people go and they study the zodiac and they learn to read the stars and they think that it has some deep meaning of fate. This goes back to the original Watcher cult and is connected to this idea that Bel is Saturn and we'll talk about that more when we get to Genesis. Okay, one of the many gods that was worshipped in Babylon was Bel. 
And we see in the names of Belshazzar and Belteshazzar that this is part of their religious service. We had already seen in a previous episode how Nabonidus was interested in the moon god. They did worship the planets. Now, Daniel being the highest Babylonian official of the Magi that was helping Cyrus run the kingdom, one day was taken by Cyrus to the temple of Bel. And he was talking to Daniel about why do you worship Jehovah when you've got these mighty gods here that are the gods of our people? Why don't you worship them? And Daniel said, these are just idols. They're not real. And Cyrus said, well, how is it then that every day I put on this enormous feast for them and we put all this meat and we put all this wine and all these wonderful things out before the gods and we close the temple and in the morning all the food's gone. That is an interesting question. Daniel said, I can prove that this isn't what you think. And so Cyrus said, well, okay, but if you're going to mock these gods and, and lose, your life's at stake. And Daniel said, okay. He said, let's go in and put the feast out just the way you want, and we're going to seal the temple. We will put a wax seal on it, post some guards, and we will guarantee that nobody enters this building, and we will see what actually happens. So Cyrus said, you bet, let's do it. They did. The next morning, Daniel and Cyrus go to the temple, and there's the doors. It's sealed. The guards are there. Nothing has changed. They open the door, and they discover all the food is gone. Okay. And Cyrus says, okay, Daniel, how do you make sense of this? What Cyrus didn't know is that prior to having the temple locked, Daniel had arranged for dust to be spread all over the floor. Oh, he's clever. He clever. is clever. Clever. So as Cyrus is gloating, Daniel says, look, look at, the, at the footprints on the ground. And he saw that there was a whole bunch of people had come in there, men, women, and children. These were the priests of Baal. And they had a secret door, and the footprints went right back to that door. And Cyrus was able to see how he had been told that the gods were eating this, and that this whole secret cast of watchers and Luciferian priests was maintaining the lie because it kept them fed. They ate really well. If you can imagine every day a feast put on by the king. Oh, Cyrus was so mad. So some of these priests paid pretty big. And this is partly why Daniel ends up getting thrown into a lion's den later. Because, oh, it's revenge because he, yes. had, he had pulled down their priestcraft. Yes, yes. They didn't like Daniel for this. He had showed him. So another wonderful story that I think is really great is Daniel the Dragon Slayer. I have heard this story, but it's it's... Most people give it pause, and I do too, because there's a dragon in it. Well, that's true. When you realize that the word dragon was actually the ancient word for what we today say as dinosaur. Oh, that's fascinating. Please elaborate. Well, the word dinosaur is a modern word that was invented by scientists. It means terrible lizard. The word did not exist until recently. A terrible lizard used to be a dragon. Every single nation that has existed has stories of dragons. They all know about them. And there are evidences that terrible lizards existed. We find their bones everywhere. So to say that they weren't with man may not be true. Oh, that's fascinating. So in this scripture, Daniel is going to bring down a terrible lizard. He becomes one of the dragon slayers. And there's a lot of them in history. Beowulf, St. George, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, there's see. statues built to him, stories from, as you were saying, every culture. That's fascinating. They became very famous for what they did. And Daniel earned a fame as one who had killed a dragon. This dragon was a pet of Nebuchadnezzar's. We do have a picture of him. Nebuchadnezzar had pictures of his favorite pets on his Ishtar gate. No, that's wonderful. That's fascinating. And on it, I've been told and I actually have seen photographs, depictions of uh, usually painted in blue animals of all sorts, things that we're more familiar with. But then there's one that is a bit unusual. And as children that play in their little sandboxes have toys, it looks an awful lot like a dinosaur. Well, that's what they say it is. It's, they call it a mythological creature, and it's the only one on the gate but interestingly enough, it actually has scales. It also has one big arrogant horn, just like John the Beloved's described when he saw the terrible lizard creature in his vision. So there's something going on here. It's supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar's pet dragon. And according to the Catholic Bible, again, this is a chapter that used to be in the Bible and the Protestants took it out. It talks about Daniel slaying it. I have it here. Would you like to read it? Please let me. So this is called Daniel the Dragon Slayer. It's from Daniel chapter 14, 23. 
And in that same place there was a great dragon, which they of Babylon worshipped. And the king, now this would be, of course, Cyrus. Is that we correct? We think it was Cyrus. It could have been Darius. He did take over Babylon at some point, but we do think it's still Cyrus. Because this is at the beginning when Daniel is becoming friends with Cyrus and his magistrate. And the king said unto Daniel, Wilt thou also say that this is of brass? Lo, he liveth, he eateth, and drinketh. Thou canst not say, He is no living God. Therefore, worship him. Then Daniel said unto the king, I will worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. The king said, I give thee leave. And Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and did seethe them together and make lumps thereof. Therefore, this he put in the dragon's mouth. And so the dragon burst in sunder. And Daniel said, Lo, these are the gods ye worship. When they of Babylon heard that, they took great indignation and conspired against the king, saying, The king is become a Jew, and he hath destroyed Bel. He hath slain the dragon and put the priests to death. Fascinating story. Do you mind elaborating on what Daniel had done? Well, this story obviously comes after the Bel story because the emperor saw that the idols were just fake. So here's a living creature, and it's like, okay, those are idols, and the priests were actually eating the food, and you got me on this one. But you can't say that this dragon here that's really quite an incredible beast isn't alive. And so this is a symbol of Bel, and so then let's worship him. And to kill him without sword is kind of astounding. But you know, he died just like William the Conqueror did. William the Conqueror had a bowel impaction that he couldn't get out and kept eating, and one day his guts exploded and he fell over dead. So basically, Daniel had made a type of indigestible, but with the fat, tasty, yes. apparently, lump that this animal, this very large animal, couldn't pass. Yes, that's right. And it burst in sunder, or it, it burst open. Uh, ugh. It must have been really stinky, yeah, can you imagine? Pretty bad, but it was very clear that it was dead, and Daniel hadn't killed it with a sword or a staff. Therefore, it can't possibly be a god. And the Jewish Daniel slew the god. So once again... The God of Daniel, Jehovah, had brought down now two gods and an empire, the greatest empire the world has ever seen. So how many times does this point have to be proven? Well, definitely Cyrus is going to give leave for the Jews to return back to Jerusalem. And some of these events are the ones that gave him proof that Daniel was indeed a prophet and that this Jehovah that they had heard about, because the story of Moses' exodus went around the world. We've found it in writings of the Druids, we found it in Ireland. They knew, they knew that this Jehovah God had freed some slaves and had crushed Egypt. And so to have these things continue, they knew his name and they're seeing that his prophet Daniel is able to say he is God. It was an important thing for the world to continue to remember. Well, it's because of things like this that the that these priests of these other religions in Babylon wanted to get rid of Daniel, revenge. And so that's ultimately how the lion's den comes about. They had a plan in Persia. The people had gotten so tired of the Babylonian rules that Nebuchadnezzar speaks and we do, that they actually put in place a new law, that the king had to make a law, and that the king then had to also live by his law. So that's the beginning of a king becoming subject to rules as opposed to everything subject to a king. Yes, they had gotten tired of the chaos that the king could say by saying, I grant you life today, but then I decide I don't like you tomorrow, and so you're dead. And so they had to have the, the king had to live by the laws he wrote too. It's a new and wonderful concept, and you know we're happy we have it today, that everyone is under the same rules. It was the start of these ideas. So they get Cyrus to pass a law that on a particular day you can only pray to a certain god, which of course was their god, and they knew Daniel wouldn't do this. So you know the story, and we won't spend too much time on this story because in the feast you can read these yourself, and we want to get on to the things that people don't know as well. But in short, Daniel refuses. He gets thrown into a lion's den, and they seal it in. And in one of the cases, the scriptures actually mention Darius, and again, he was the father-in-law of Cyrus. So we don't know if Cyrus had passed on or if he has moved to the capital and Darius is running Babylon, which is probably what's going on. Well, the Lord saves Daniel both times. 
he shuts the mouths of these lions. And as you know, Darius runs to Daniel the moment he can and finds that he's still alive. And he, and even one time when he puts Daniel in the lion's den, he says, I know your God can save you. You just hear the heartbreak that he had to follow the law he had written, that you, if you don't pray on this day to these gods, you know, you're dead. So he had to do it. And then just to weep when he realized he'd been set up. And he didn't let his priest set him up again. No, that's good. At least he learned from his mistakes. He realized where the danger was. The only reason I want to just pause this for a moment is because this actually happened to Daniel twice. And what the traditions say, particularly what the Jews say, there is a scripture in the Old Testament by a prophet named Habakkuk. I've heard people try to pronounce that prophet's name many times. (laughs) Nobody reads Habakkuk. I probably shouldn't say that because they probably do. But there's certain books that they go, huh? And Habakkuk is one of those probably no one's read. But what is so interesting is Habakkuk's most famous moment comes here at this time. He was one of the few Jews that was allowed to stay in Jerusalem. There weren't very many, and the ones that stayed were mostly reduced to vineyard keepers or planters, and they sort of stayed to plant some crops and maybe run a small vineyard. They were really poor. It wasn't a very glamorous thing to do. They didn't take a lot of joy in walking around this completely ruined area. But Habakkuk was one of those that was left behind to till the ground. He was also a prophet. One of these times that Daniel is in the lion's den, he isn't given any food. And this might be the first time, actually, although I don't remember at the moment. I'm not sure it's clear in the writings. Anyway, Habakkuk is told, you must take some of the food from Jerusalem and rush it to Daniel. He is in need. And Habakkuk says, he's 700 miles away. Yeah, it would take weeks, maybe even a month to get there. And the Lord says, if you're willing to do it, I'll make it happen. And Habakkuk says, you bet. So Habakkuk gets some food ready, and an angel comes and carries him, brings him right into Babylon and into the lion's den, and he gives food to Daniel. Now, the reason that's interesting, if you know that, and you go and read the book of Habakkuk that nobody reads, it makes sense. Because Habakkuk is talking about these things in a way that you wouldn't understand. You read the book and you go, what is he talking about? And so that's why I actually buy the story. It's collaborated in tradition and in Habakkuk's own writings. He talks about these things. From 700 miles away. And Daniel was deeply touched by this. Daniel loved Habakkuk. There is actually some evidence that Habakkuk was his mentor when he was a young prince and that that was why Daniel was so relieved to see him. Habakkuk was old, but he was a dear old friend and a mentor and a teacher, sort of like Aristotle was to Alexander. And he came to Daniel in his time of need with food and comforted him. So in the book of Daniel, in this in Appendix C of the book, one of the interesting prophets who had interaction with Daniel was Habakkuk. Jewish tradition and the Catholic Bible have preserved the interesting story of the Lord sending Habakkuk 720 miles in an instant to comfort and feed Daniel, who had been condemned to die in the lion's den. This may have taken place over the time that the rest of the Jews were celebrating Passover with their families, as it is said that Habakkuk came and read the Haggadah with Daniel. Habakkuk's few writings preserved to us have been highly praised for showing intelligence and poetic talent. Tradition holds that Habakkuk was the son promised by Elisha to a barren woman in 2 Kings 4.16. He has been called both a Levite and a Simeonite, but either way, his residence was Jerusalem. The three chapters of Habakkuk speak of Nebuchadnezzar's successful destruction of Judea. It reads like a mini Daniel in parts. His writings add credence to the possibility that Habakkuk knew Daniel well, Perhaps he had once been the boy's tutor of the Torah. It is interesting to note that when the Lord called him to visit Daniel 720 miles away in Babylon, he did not claim that he didn't know Daniel, only that he didn't know how to find him in such a vast capital city. Perhaps it's time we all reread Habakkuk. Well, with that, it looks like we've run out of time. Uh, We welcome everyone to read with us. The book of Daniel is a marvelous feast. And we've begun with it because it's a gateway to understanding the rest of the scriptures. Once again, we thank you. This podcast is not associated with any denomination. This is our understanding of the gospel, and we welcome you to feast with us. And until our next podcast, may the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. (music) 